In Revelation 8, look at verse 3. It says, Then another angel stood, having the golden censer. He came and stood at the altar. He was given much incense, that he should offer it with the prayers of all the saints upon the golden altar. The prayers of all the saints. Remember I told you a few days back that God collects all of our prayers? They're in these bowls. We saw that in chapter 5 and verse 8. And then here in chapter 8 and verse 3, they are scooped up. And with the, the offerings that are coming from the presence of God in the angels' hands, it's almost like they throw the prayers out and they are answered by these judgments. See, we have been praying for the Lord to right wrongs and to, to help the oppressed and to, to punish the evildoers. And he doesn't do it. He waits. So what are you supposed to do? God's listening to all those prayers. He's keeping track of it. He'll answer them in his perfect time. It's time to pray. But when he starts acting, that's these trumpets of doom. When God responds, it's time to flee. And that's the last few verses of chapter uh, 8. God strikes the environment that mankind protects. Uh, it says in verse 5, that uh, the angel took a censer and there were noises and thunders and lightnings and earthquakes and the first trumpet sounds in verse 7 and hail and fire mingled with blood were thrown on the earth and a third of all the trees was burned up and all the green grass. That means all the photosynthesis is deeply impacted. That cleanses, takes the, the CO2 out. You know, I mean the whole process of what we need for life. Most likely there are volcanic eruptions from the quake, water, steam, ash upward, comes back down as hail. Eruptions may ignite the forest, a third of all the trees. Then verse eight, we have an extinction level event. Uh, second angel sounded something like a great mountain burning with fire, it sounds like an asteroid. Uh, it was thrown into the sea and a third of the sea becomes blood. And it strikes the oceans, devastates a third of all ships, perhaps a tsunami tidal wave. God either turns the oceans to blood or lets the normal process of red tide poison the ocean. Uh, Bonnie and I were ministering down south uh, in uh, Florida when the red tide came in and, and we would walk along the beach and you would see every creature gasping, dying on the shore from the smallest and the longer red tide went until uh, you know, dolphins, porpoises were, were beaching. They were dying from the red tide. And every fish and every creature in between. And God shows what he can do with the oceans. What's interesting is there's a new study, remember, with knowledge increasing? NEOs, near, e near Earth Objects. Uh, this is a picture one. Uh, last year, asteroid Florence passed by, and NASA showed it was the largest near Earth object ever approaching. And this was the headlines on that day. It's coming tonight. If that thing would have come into our atmosphere, it would have looked very much like what I just read. And uh, the solar stabilities, the fourth trumpet, uh, starting, look at verse uh, 12. Then the fourth angel sounded, and a third of the sun was struck, and a third of the moon, and a third of the stars. So the third of them were dark, and a third of the day didn't shine, likewise the night. And basically, God shows us something. Um, basically, the, the star that I just read about could be a comet that strikes the atmosphere and spreads poison. The solar power getting hit. God the Son who ignited the sun on the fourth day of creation now dials them down a third. It says a third of all the luminescence declined. That would have horrible implications. This dramatic temperature drop would prompt fearsome weather that Luke 21 reminds us of. And it would devastate the fragile life of plants and animals and people. Now the Lord dials them back up because the sun begins to burn in chapter 16. But just before all that happens, that's when God sends those 144,000 evangelists, our 13th session together. Why does God allow the aliens everybody's always talked about and watched movies about, played video games about, read science fiction about, why does God let the real aliens invade the earth? See, that's what chapter 9 is about, and it's fascinating. Now, I don't, I don't know if uh, Titus and all of his wonderful work is going to work out. He's already gotten all of last week's slides. He's converted them all to your uh, uh, Microsoft kind you need, and he's turned them in for them to be uploaded in Canvas, and I don't know if they ever will. I also last night sent him all of this week's, everything I'm showing you, and he's busily working on those. But if all that doesn't come... 
this is what you really need to know uh, for the final exam uh, and for your next quiz. The book of Revelation has these topics that you should know where to find them in Revelation and share with people, okay? Uh, someone will ask you, where are the seven churches? You say, oh, that's in Revelation 2 and 3. And someone will ask you, where are the 24 elders in heaven? You say, oh, uh, the church in heaven is chapter 4 and 5. And someone will say, where are those 144,000? And you say, chapter 7, I remember reading and studying that. And chapter 14, they're in two places actually. How about this hour? Where are the cosmic monsters in the pit? They're in Revelation chapter 9. And you could go through the, the whole list, but you should know those. So Revelation 2 and 3 is the seven churches. The 24 elders are 4 and 5. The, the 144,000 are 7 and 14. This hour we're looking at the cosmic monsters in the pit. The two witnesses come in chapter 11. The dragon and the woman are in chapter 12. The beast and the Antichrist is fully uh, profiled in chapter 13. Armageddon is chapter 16. And then the origin of Satan. Where did he come from? People always wonder that. His biography, his story of how he became from the highest created being God ever made, the, the smartest, the most powerful being God created, fell. He went from Lucifer, the son of the morning, to Satan, the adversary of God. And that's in two places, Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel 28. You also need to know uh, where we are in the book and how to navigate around and uh, both in the next quiz uh, this Thursday and your final. And you should know kind of this progression, but especially uh, some of the hard ones are when chapters are broken up. Like the second coming is Revelation 19, the last half. The millennium is Revelation 20, the first six verses, et cetera, et cetera. And I've shown you that also in this form of chart. And so right now today we're in the big red box, the tribulation. And what we're looking at is Lucifer, this greatest creature, most powerful creature God ever created, and his fallen angels, the real alien invaders. By the way, there's nothing else in this universe than what God has made, and God has told us everything we need to know. So there are not life forms on the 50,000 possible planets out there that someday we're going to bump into that are somehow going to help us with our, you know, problems we're having on earth with anything. The, the aliens of this universe, God has identified, and that's what we're going to study in chapter 9. And what's interesting is, when this book was written, the occult was very, very present in the Roman Empire. See, for us living in America and Western culture, there's a subduing of that. But if you ever go to any of the less Christianized parts of the world, you find the occult and demonic powers and demons and all that is just very much in your face. I remember when Bonnie and I were ministering in Kyoto in Japan. Um, you can just, you can go into some of those Shinto shrines and you can feel the demonic power. I mean, literally, for any believer, you are so aware that they worship the dead and the, the kind of the vast amount of demons that are all involved. In fact, in the, the Shinto temples, they actually, when you walk up to them and come to the door to enter, there's a white kind of pile. They, they pour salt at the doorways of all the Shinto uh, temples because they believe demons can't cross salt. So they keep them inside. Very interesting uh, how their, their belief about that is. And of course, it's not biblical. But these churches were in the epicenter of the empire, which, do you remember when we were covering Pergamos? It's where Satan's throne was, and Satan's headquarters was there. So these people are doing very much hand-to-hand -hand combat. That's why the book of Revelation, uh, when we find the first church of Ephesus in chapter 2, we know what Paul taught them because we have the book of Ephesians. And what did he teach them? Be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Take up the whole armor of God that you might be able to stand in the evil day and having done all to stand, stand therefore. And you know all the spiritual armor. That's what these people knew. So back to where we are. Chapter 6 has the four horsemen. We went through them. Then the martyrs. Then that cosmic earthquake. Chapter 7 is the box, the ceiling of the 144,000. Chapter 8 starts with the silence and then the seven trumpets. Now look what has happened. 
Number one in the fourth seal back in chapter 6, one-fourth, 25% of all the population of earth dies. Now when we get to the sixth trumpet, 33% more people died. That totals 58% of the population. This is what it looks like, those trumpets. The first trumpet was the grass. The second trumpet was probably the comet, the, the, or, or I mean the asteroid. Then the next one is the wormwood, the poisoning of the waters. Then the sun dials back. Now look where we are. We're in the three woes. Look at the end of chapter 8 and notice what the angel says. And I looked and heard an angel flying through the midst of heaven saying with a loud voice, Woe, woe, woe to the inhabitants of the earth because of the remaining blasts of the trumpets. So there are three blasts left. We have three trumpets. The fourth one hits, we need five, six, and seven. So those are the three woes. So verse 1 of chapter 9, the fifth angel sounded. So you can see the fifth angel there are what are called demon locusts. They're awful. And I saw a star fallen from heaven to the earth. And to him was given a key to the bottomless pit. Now, wait a minute. During the Gospels, what did Jesus say? He said, I saw, it's like lightning coming down to the earth. And he was talking about Satan coming down because of the, the great strides the Gospel was making. And Satan is not omnipresent. And what Jesus was saying is Satan was coming down to kind of stem the tide of the Gospel, which is his full-time job. He's trying to thwart and be an adversary to God, comes down again, most likely. And the fifth angel sounded, a star fallen from heaven to earth, and to him was given the key to the bottomless pit. And he opened the bottomless pit, and smoke arose out of the pit like the smoke of a great furnace. Every time it says like, John is having trouble putting into to human language what he's seeing. It's just so uh, unbelievable. And uh, the sun and the air were darkened because of the smoke of the pit. And out of the smoke, verse 3, locusts came on the earth, and to them was given power like scorpions uh, on the earth have power, and they were commanded not to harm it. And we get into this, and what is going on? Well, these 12 verses are about these demon locusts. They look like locusts. Uh, they have characteristics of locusts, like even the life cycle, the five-month life cycle, uh, and, and everything about locusts. But they're not physical locusts. They're different. They are demon locusts. And what we see is there the, the first part of the three woes. The second part, you see there is the Euphrates angels. Uh, four angels get loose. In fact, uh, I'll read it starting in verse 13. And uh, chapter 9, verse 13, a sixth angel sounded, and I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar, which is before God, saying to the sixth angel who had the trumpet, release the four angels who are bound at the great river Euphrates. God says that you all know where the river Euphrates is. You can see it on the map, you know, kind of like it was on every map during the you know, Iraq War when America had so many troops over there at the Euphrates River. Somewhere over there at the cradle of civilization, God has four angels that, that are bound somewhere by the great river Euphrates. Verse 15, the four angels who had been prepared for an hour and a day and a month were released, look at this, to kill a third of mankind. And the number of the armies of the horsemen was 200 million. Now all of a sudden we've got all these people and they're talking about this is the Chinese, right? This is a Chinese army. There's, they're the only country on earth that could have 200 million soldiers. They're not a Chinese army. These are not humans. Just the description, they're not humans. These are four demons, four fallen, and, and, and they are... But they're not these locusts either. These are, these are two different woes, so we'll cover that. Then chapter 10 we're going to get to, and then finally all this is finished. So let's, let's get down to it. Lucifer, his biography is in Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel 28. These four horsemen his, his, are representative of his real alien invaders. Demons are the real alien invaders of Revelation chapter 9. And John introduces us to the dreadful realm of fallen spirits and where they live, the abyss. And it's awful. It's enough to, to you know, keep you awake at night if you didn't know that you had the protection of the Spirit of God. So number one, God's super angels are the most powerful creatures in the universe. That's why when we see them in chapter 9, uh, this, this 
star falling from heaven. This is one of God's super angels. They're amazing. But God has a maximum security cosmic being real alien prison. You know, they're not in Area 51. Don't worry about it. You know, like uh, Independence Day movie was about, that they had these things that were like demons there. No, no. These things are in God's prison. No one gets out of it until he lets them. And Satan is most likely the star God allows to open the pit. And this abyss is mentioned seven times. Look there. 9-1, 9-2, 9-11, 11-7, 17-18, and 21 and 23. The seven times, this, this abusas is the Greek word. And this abyss is the prison for the worst demonic creatures. Jesus talked about it in Luke 8.31. Remember when the, the angel or the demon said, don't send us to the, the abyss, we don't want to go there. That's, you can't get out. They like to roam. 2 Peter 2 talks about them, verse 4. Jude talks about them. Uh, these are angels that are so lethal, so vile, so malignant, that if they're let out, they would destroy everything. And so God keeps them incarcerated. So the whole topic, this is angelology in, in systematic theology. Systematic theology has many different divisions. Uh, these are the most powerful creatures in the universe. Stronger than the Eternals, stronger than the Avengers, stronger than, you know, all those are false. These are real. And these are the ones God talks about. Where did they come from? Well, the doctrine of the creation of angels and you know, I'm slipping a little bit forward to help you understand to chapter 12 explains how Satan uh, took a third of the heavenly hosts. So here's what happened. God created all angels. Two-thirds remain with God and serve him. One-third rebelled. Some of them were so bad, they're in prison. The abusas, the abyss that we see in chapter 9. Most of them are not. So let's talk about the most that are not. Most that are not are angels. They're a third of the angels. They're demons now. But let's talk about all angels. Each of the angels we read about in God's word has power. Each of them has power, exceeds anything that we can understand as a human, as possible by the laws of the physical world. So every angel is off the chart. That's why the Lord said, and that's why Paul said, don't worship angels. People are given to worshiping angels. In fact, there's even all these people that like to keep their little angels around and they buy them, you know, at precious moments and all that. Don't get into that. You're, you, all of that, especially the cultic part and the gaming part, is very dangerous. But why? Because God is absolutely all-powerfully greater than everything. So when you go into angelology, it's, a, it's easy to get kind of fearful. But God says, don't be fearful. But he said, I want you to know the real aliens that, that swirl around us. And God explains them. And by the way, if, if, if they can make humans think that they're aliens from some other civilization that are bringing new technology, they've accomplished their, their feat. Their only goal angels have is, fallen angels, demons, is to distract people from the truth. And if they can distract them with drugs, they do it. If they can do it with immorality, they do it. The bigger thing they do is false religion. They do it. And now, with the endless distractions of electronica, the demons are very active there, getting people away from the truth. And if they can get a Christian to be more interested in, in science fiction or in entertainment or anything else than God, then they've accomplished their purpose to distract us. Angels are supernatural and super powerful creatures. As far as we know, angelic creatures are indestructible. You ever think about that? They can't be killed. You can't destroy them. Now, Frank Peretti wrote, you know, all of his books, and uh, the angels would blow up and stuff. But as far as we know, they can't be killed or destroyed. They can be imprisoned. They travel the universe effortlessly. They don't, have, they don't need spaceships. They seemingly never rest or sleep. And there's only one verse that implies that they even need to eat. In the Psalms, it talks about angels' food. That, and we don't know... Uh, if that implies that they eat something. But we do know that they're not self-sustaining. Why? Because only God is self-sufficient. Everything else needs to be fed, to be repowered, to be... See, only God is self-contained, self-sufficient, uh, eternal, infinite, you know, uh, needing no plug-in. Angels are only kept alive by the power of God. Demons are only kept alive by the power of God. We are... Remember... 
life's breath we talked about last hour. You know, God holds our life's breath. He's the one that keeps us alive. In him we live and move and have our being, Acts 17 says. But what are the angels? Well, we know of at least five orders of the good angels. The angels I'm calling good, the bad ones I'm calling demons. Both are angels, they're good and bad angels. Lucifer was the guardian. He was the number one top. Highest, how do we know he's so powerful? Because Michael, the, the head of the armies of the Lord, when Michael came near Satan at the burial of the body of Moses, do you know what Jude tells us? I'm sure you know what Jude tells us. I'll read it to you. It says, Now even Michael, the archangel, verse 9 of Jude 1, who contended with the devil when he disputed about the body of Moses, dared not bring against him a reviling accusation, but said the Lord rebuke you. The highest good angel doesn't tangle with Satan. He backs up and says, the Lord take care of you. That's the highest of all the good angels. Satan is the most powerful, most brilliant, the most greatest creature God ever made. And he fell. Someone asked me about, uh, you know, one of the perennial questions is, where did evil come from? Uh, remember, I was a youth pastor, so I'm not going to get into the philosophical, you know, the, what the great minds have pondered. But let me show you something. God alone is self-sufficient. Everyone else needs help to continue. Here's the greatest creature God ever made. Satan is a purple pen, or Lucifer was. Now notice why the pen is standing up. I'm holding it. Everything in the universe needs holding. Watch what happens when I stop holding. Whoop. I tried to hold it up, but you can't. And what, what evil is, is when God takes his finger off. Nothing can keep up. It all goes downhill. The scriptures put it this way, who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation. Those who never choose to let God hold them up just get further and further fallen from him. How did Satan fall? God temporarily took away the holding, and boom, he fell. That's what you read about. And if we were doing Isaiah 14, when I teach Isaiah, we go all through that in Ezekiel 28. But Lucifer was the guardian. He's called the covering cherub. Uh, actually, I think of him as like any of you that are photographers, you know those big parabolic reflectors that you boof the light in and it diffuses it so you get a good picture, you know, for the uh, portrait mode or whatever. Satan was like a his wings because, you know, he's he's was called the anointed covering cherub. He kind of looks like a big reflector hood over the throne of God, reflecting the glory of God back on God. And he was up there with all that glory. And it says in Isaiah and Ezekiel, he thought in his heart, this is really nice. And one of the greatest proofs of inspiration is he doesn't say in Isaiah or Ezekiel, I'm going to be greater than God because he knows he's a created thing. No one in their right mind knows they could be greater than God, what did he say? I will become like him. And he started absorbing that glory. And that's the essence of pride. When we want to be like God, not in surrender to him, but kind of like, well, look at the spelling. L-U-C-I-F-E-R. Now spell pride. P-R-I-F-E-R. I, D, E. Then look at sin, S, I. Do you know what's the center of everything? I. And that's what happened with Lucifer and he fell, but he still was number one. The cherubim are next. Uh, Lucifer was the highest cherubim, so we know what he looks like. I already told you that, you know, four faces and covered with eyes. Then we have the archangels, like Michael and Gabriel. There are two that are mentioned. Then we have the seraphim. That's actually just a Hebrew word that means the burning ones. They're constantly burning. And they almost, in Isaiah, look interchangeable with the cherubim. But then we have all the normal angels, and there are lots of them. But on the bad side, there are at least seven orders 
of bad. They're probably seven of the good ones. They just, you know, God is not telling us everything. He's only telling us what we need to know. There's the angel of light. That's the worst one. That's Satan. Then we're going to meet in just a moment. The number one general of Satan is called the destroyer. His name is Abaddon or Apollyon. That's why I tell young people, the gamers, I say, I wouldn't play a game that has the name of the very worst of all the demons out there that's down in a pit somewhere that God lets out from time to time because I wouldn't want to attract his attention. Of course, I wouldn't play anything. God says don't have anything to do with demons, so I wouldn't anyway, but I would especially avoid a bad and Apollyon destroyer games. Then there are the horrible monsters of the destroyer that come out that, that we just saw. Then there are the doomed angels that, that not only are in the abyss, they have chains on them. Peter talks about them. They are, it says they're in everlasting chains under darkness awaiting the judgments of the last day. They are so malignant. They're the ones that cause the whole earth to get flooded and they cause so much problem at the time of Noah that God just chained them up and they're waiting for hell. Then we have in chapter 10 of Daniel the nation princes, the prince of Persia. Did you know Iran, that's the ancient name of Iran is Persia. Did you know that Iran has its own demon that's in charge? Uh, oh, there's another uh, movie, The Prince of Persia. That's a movie, you know, and it's all about the occult too. And so all of this stuff, truth seeps into, you know, all of the media. And of course, they, they distort it a little bit. But there's the Prince of Greece. There's the Prince of Persia. There are all these princes that, that are demons that control nations. Then Paul introduces a whole sixth category when he's talking about spiritual warfare. He says, principalities, powers, rulers of darkness this age, spiritual hosts of wickedness. We don't know if that's one kind of angel or many kinds of angels. And then there are just plain demons that Jesus is bumping into everywhere. So at least seven groups. But think about this. Our God is greater than the sum of everything he created. So God is greater than the whole universe. You know, they just got that new telescope out there. It's so amazing. Science. I love science. In fact, I had a MIT scholarship to work on data transmission over lasers. And I turned it down to go to Bob Jones University, and I'm so thankful. But if I'd have stayed in the data transmission on lasers way back in the 70s, what they're finding out there is unbelievable. They, they started mapping the universe. The British were leading. They decided they're going to map the entire universe from every point on Earth so that we get a complete 360, you know, complete map of the universe. And they assigned all these astronomers, and they mapped the whole universe. Then they started, everything has a quadrant. Now every part of the universe is named you know, all the quadrant, and then they assigned higher learning to, to go into each quadrant and learn all they can. And when they learned, you can see all this, by the way, at the Creation Museum, you know, Ken Ham's place, their planetarium does this. When they assigned the square, like to Caltech Berkeley, that was their square, they started examining it. What they found that they thought were stars in their square Many of them weren't stars, they were galaxies. And what they thought were galaxies in their quadrant, when they studied it more closely, they found out they were clusters of galaxies. In other words, what they said is, there's so much out there, they don't understand, they, don't even, they can't even number, you know. Our God is greater than all the universe, the earth that we know a little bit about, and the entire spiritual world I'm just talking to you about. So basically, why does all this matter? Well, what can demons do? They're supernatural creatures. Well, here's what they can do. We see it in verse 3. When God allows them to, they can become predators. How would you like a predator that is not stopped by doors? You know, all the dinosaur movies, you know, like uh, Jurassic Park, the dinosaurs, the, vel the velociraptors are always run into the doors, and if you put a fire extinguisher or an axe in the door, they can't get in. Demons aren't like that. They're not stopped by material walls. It's amazing. The locusts are demonic creatures that John struggles to describe as you read it this week. He has to use the word like nine times. That means like I don't know how to describe it. It's just, it's just blowing his circuits. Like scorpions, they can paralyze victims with pain, like real scorpions, that can cause foaming at the mouth, grinding of the teeth, because of the venom. 
like those real locusts on earth that have a five-month lifespan from May to September, God limits this judgment to only five months. Now notice, no one dies from these predators. For five months, you just can't get away from the wrath of God that you feel like this horrible sting. But then, the real destroyer is unleashed. That's the preview of hell. That's why we have chapter 9. Chapter 9 is God giving humanity a preview of hell while the 144,000 are out trying to lead everybody to the Lord just before the two witnesses come and the gospel angel. God is not willing that any should perish. He says, I want to get your attention. What was I supposed to announce? Uh Uh-huh. I forgot what's your name. Carson, my friend, just reminded me. I saw you, that little smile you gave me. That the study guide says you have to pick 10 chapters from between 6 to 22. That's a mistake. For years, I only taught Revelation 6 to 22, and Dr. Davis taught 1 to 5. A few years back, I don't know, 5 or so, they asked me to do all of it, but that, that old thing is still out there somewhere. You know how you can never erase stuff. So it's any 10 chapters from all 22. How many of you had that question? Okay. So good. You were right. When one person comes and asks me, probably 10 people had the same question. The rest of you haven't read the assignment sheet, so you should get down to it, okay? It's time. Okay, the real destroyer is unleashed. Here we meet the most powerful demon under Satan. He's called Apollyon. He's called Abaddon. Apollyon is a Greek. Abaddon is a Hebrew. Both translate destroyer. That's what it is in English. There's nowhere to go. There's no escape. There's no secure room to hide from creatures that transcend physical barriers. This is the main reason why the tribulation is so bad. You can't get away from God. Now, you can't get away from him anyway, but most people don't care. They don't think about him, and they, they put him out of their mind. So God says, you can put me out of your mind. I will get your attention. I'm going to send these things that can go through walls and into your safe room. You know, during the Ukrainian war, it says all the, the oligarchs, the billionaire Russians are all going to their safe rooms and their, their you know, bomb shelters and everything because they want to be safe. You can't hide when God lets these demons out. Think of all those bound demons in the pit being turned loose in addition to the ones that are already running all over the earth. And as if these hordes are not bad enough, out of the smoke from the pit. Look, look at verse 11. I mean, you talk about this would make a great movie, you know? Uh, after everything going on, and then, verse 11, they had a king over them, the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in Hebrew is Abaddon, but in Greek he has the name of Apollyon. And you see him coming up as all these locust things are you know, going, and all of a sudden, the destroyer shows up. Amazing. Well, let's think about him. He's not just here. He's in Exodus 12. Did you know that? Do you know what he did on one night? Have you ever thought about what the Passover event was? God let this angel out for one night, very limited what he could do. What did he do? He went over the nation of Egypt and with no special forces, night goggles, no, uh, you know, field kit DNA sample things, he finds the firstborn of every family of humans and the firstborn of every family animal, the cattle in the stalls. He's able to to cover one angel, covers the entire nation of Egypt, in one night, finding the firstborn male child in every family, and in their bed, they die. No one else does. In fact, the Bible says they didn't know until a while went by when, when people started weeping when they found their baby dead. Then it woke everybody else up, but it seemed to have been a silent death. And then he got out into everybody's barn and killed the firstborn of their cattle. In one night, one angel knew where they all were in the dark, could find the right one in their bed, could find the right one in the stall. Wow. You see why God keeps him penned up? What if God hadn't put any limits on him? He's in 2 Samuel 24, kills during that 
that judgment on David's pride. 1 Corinthians 10, 10. I'll read you that one. Um, 1 Corinthians 10, 10. It says, Nor complain when some of them also complained and were destroyed by the destroyer. That happened in uh, Numbers 14. Isn't that amazing? The angel, and he shows up here. The angel's name is Destroyer. Hebrew, Abaddon, Greek, Apollyon. Wow. The greatest loss of human life arrives. Starting verse 13, the sixth trumpet sounds. If this, if this wasn't bad enough, the pain. Now the four bound angels, allowed by God, lead a demonic army that numbers 200 million horsemen that destroys a third of all remaining humans. This event is not to be confused with the later human army announced by the seventh trumpet led by demons in Revelation 16. That's a human army. The Armageddon army are people. And they are coming from the east. And probably there will be Chinese and every other eastern nation soldiers and as well as all the, the people from the republics, the former Soviet republics, everybody is going to come to that because the whole world converges on Armageddon. But these are 200 million demon horsemen. This demonic army destroys a third of all remaining humans. Why am I going through all this? Well, look at verse 20 of chapter 9 because I want to show you something. Um, whoops, I'm in 1 Corinthians. Revelation chapter 9 and verse... But the rest of mankind who are not killed by these plagues, so that's the 42% of humans alive, who have already seen, I mean, the comets and the asteroids and the demons and all this stuff, did not repent of the works of their hands, that they should not worship demons and idols of gold and silver and brass and stone and wood, which cannot see or or walk. I mean, how nothing idols are. And did not repent of their murders, their pharmakeia, that's the Greek word, pharmakeia, drugs involved, you know, the drugs that open the mind to, you know, remember the mind is the portal between the physical and the spiritual world. And, and drugs free the mind from some of the restraint and, and that, that's why it's always involved with with worship of demons, drugs, sorceries, or their sexual immorality or their thefts. What I wrote is this. Sin is far more powerful than we realize. Despite all the horrors, all the cataclysms, people are still chained by their sins of rebellion that only Christ can release us from. Remember what it says in chapter 8 of John, verse 32 to 35, whom the Son will set free will be free indeed. You want to know the acid proof of salvation? you now can say no to sin. The grace of God that brings salvation, Titus 2 says, teaches us we can say no to sin. You know what one of the greatest thrills is? Being tempted and, and looking that temptation straight in the eye and like Joseph saying, no, I will not sin against God. You feel the grace of God so much at that moment. But despite all that, people are still chained to their sins of rebellion because only Christ can release us from them. And John lists the five. Do you remember what days ago, last week, we talked about the Thyatirans, and I told you about sins against our body and all that stuff I was talking about? And it says, Jesus said, you know the depths of Satan. This is the depths of Satan. When a believer gets imprisoned by these horrible sins, they're experiencing the depths of Satan. Okay, now it's time to go to chapter 10. Some of you thought we'd never make it there, and here we go. God reminds us he's in control. Look at chapter 10. I saw another mighty angel coming down from heaven, clothed with a cloud, and a rainbow was on his head. His face was like the sun. His feet were like pillars of fire. This is describing what Jesus looks like, only it's not Jesus, okay? But it describes what Jesus looks like. You know, the covenant and the face like bright and blinding. And, and uh, like the sun we see in chapter 1, his feet like pillars of fire. That's also in chapter 1. But he had a little book in his hand. And he puts one foot in the sea, and the other foot, on the left foot on the land, and cries with a loud voice, and seven thunders uttered their voices, and when the seven thunders uttered their voices, John says, I was about to write down verse 4, what I heard from heaven, but a voice said to me, seal up 
the things which the seven thunders uttered and don't write them. There's something God didn't want us to know. There's a lot of things God doesn't want us to know. Only what he wants us to know do we know. Deuteronomy 29, 29, the secret things belong to God, but those that are revealed belong to us. I would worry about what I know and what the Bible says rather than everything I don't know and wonder. And Most people spend most of their time on the white spaces of the Bible, the stuff it doesn't say. Why don't we just focus on what it does say? And that's, that's what this chapter's about. God reminds us he's in control. And by the way, God pauses the horror movie of Revelation to encourage us with all our troubles that present us, or I mean that surround us, with his beauty, power, and grace and perfect plan. That's what he does in chapter 7. He does it again in chapter 10. He's going to do it again in 14 and 15. Each pause, they call it a parenthesis, and theologians that commentate on the Bible call it a parenthesis. Each pause in Revelation is to remind us of what we learned the first day. He is, remember, we're in this secure compartment. He is all-powerful. He's all-knowing. He's always with us, and he loves us. And we're secure. And he's leading us in every event in history toward the promised victory. But, as I already said, Jesus is not portrayed as an angel in the New Testament. Um, the mighty angels often have thought of as Christ, but because of the word another, it clearly refers to God's messengers of judgment. Another. See how it says in chapter 10? I saw another mighty angel. Jesus is not another. He is God and God the Son. And so this, I mean, the, the language says it's not Jesus. It's best to never think of Jesus as being portrayed as an angel. Uh, in the Old Testament, he's the angel of the Lord. Um, number three, this little book. It's the same title deed we probably saw in chapter five. It's open in chapter six. And the angel's feet uh, remind us that despite Satan's temporary rebellion, the Lord rules everything. That's why he puts his feet like that. And then I like this. Look, look at verse 3. It says, uh, and he, he, they cried out with uh, like a lion roars and cried out with seven thunders. Have you ever noticed how many sevens there are? Well, I did when I was reading. There are 54 sevens. There are 18 sets. You can, you can study that. In order they are, seven churches, seven spirits, seven lampstands, stars, lamps of fire, seals, horns, eyes, spirits of God, angels, trumpets, thunders, Heads, crowns, last plagues, golden bulls, mountains, and kings. They're just complete sets. It's the way of God communicating. But this is the important part. God's sweet and sour word. John illustrates what God's word in Revelation does in the life of a believer. Look what happens in verse 7. And in the days of the sounding of the seventh angel, he's about to sound, God would be, his mystery of God would be finished. He declared to his servants the prophets. Then a voice spoke to me and said, Go, take the little book which is open in the hand of the angel who stands in the sea. And I went to the angel and said to him, Give me the little book. And he says, Take and eat it. It'll make your stomach bitter, but it'll be sweet as honey in your mouth. And John did it. John illustrates what God's word and revelation does in the life of all believers through the ages that take the challenge to be blessed as we read it. There are two effects of revelation will have. The sweetness of anticipating God's victory over sin and his vengeance on sinners, but it's the nauseating reality of how horrible the effects of sin are on both creation and fallen sinners. It makes us sick. I, Bonnie and I were teaching um, at a medical missions conference, uh, I think in Thailand, and all the doctors came from all these closed countries. And I was teaching along on uh, Ephesians 6. I actually was doing the armor of God. And these doctors come for two weeks from all over the world. They're medical missionaries, and they're all struggling. It's very hard where they live. Everyone's opposed to the gospel. They're there because they love Christ, and they're trying to lead people to Christ. And their stories made us cry often. But after one of the sessions, this doctor, you always know the doctors. They come in those scrubs, you know, those, those uh, kind of, turquoise, I don't know what color they are, but bluish, tinge, green colored scrubs, you know, usually have the little stethoscope. And so this doctor came up, I think he even had those little things on his feet, you know, like those uh, little mesh things they put over their feet. And he came up after I spoke, because he was going into a medical um, seminar. And uh, he looked at me and said, you're in my book. I mean, there's 800 medical personnel in the auditorium, and I just 
taught my heart out for an hour. And you never know what people mean. I mean, even you guys, you come up, you, some of you say unusual things. And I love, and I always smile and say, oh, thank you. And so I said, oh, thank you. But I said, what does that mean? You're in my book. And he went like this. I'll never forget it. He pulled out of his pocket a little tiny moleskin. Do you know what moleskins are? They're a, a kind of a notebook that are expensive. And they make one that's really small that just fits in your back pocket. And he popped that thing open. He said, I'm a doctor. He said, I work, you know, in Jordan, right on the border with, you know, Syria. And he said, where ISIS is. He said, and, and our hospital um, patches up the people that are blown up and shot up and all the conflicts going on here. Some of them are soldiers. Some of them are Jordanians. Some of them are Syrians. Some of them are Afghanians, whatever. He said, but, but I work in the the ISIS impacted region. And he said, the problem is between my hospital and the army base, the US army base where I live, he said, there's a road I have to drive on every day. And he said, plus I have to go several days a week and drop my children off at the, the army provided school for US military personnel. And he was considered part of the medical staff so he could drop his kids off. And he says, I have three stair step daughters. He said, they all had blonde hair, blue eyes, look like their mother. And he said, he said, I used to be a doctor, I think either at Johns Hopkins or Harvard. Um, I don't know. One of the uber big famous hospitals. And he said, but the Lord stirred my heart that I wanted to go to the hardest region to share the gospel. And he said, so I have a problem. He says, I will be in surgery and I'll finish the surgery. And he says, all of a sudden this darkness comes over me and he says it comes down over me and I feel like I'm being suffocated and he said I can't think I'm so afraid I think they're going to capture my kids and murder them at the school or I think they're going to capture my wife after she drops me off at the hospital and drives back to the military base or he says I think when we're all in the car they're going to capture us and blow us up he said I just get scared and he said I can't do surgery I can't do anything and he says I found the only place in the hospital I can go is the restroom and he said, I go in the restroom and I turn that lock and I'm all alone in that room. And he says, then I pull this book out. And he said, how you got in my book is today as you were teaching, one of the verses, he said, by the way, I didn't listen to anything else you said. He said, one of the verses that you talked about so got my attention. He said, I looked it up in the Bible, I copied it in my book, and then I wrote a prayer, the application prayer from it. And he said, so the next time I'm in surgery and the dark cloud of demonic oppression and fear comes over me and I'm paralyzed with fear and don't want to serve the Lord and can't go forward. He said, I'm going to run to the bathroom, lock the door, pull out my moleskin. And he said, I'm going to probably read what you just shared. He said, that's what I mean. You're in my book. And he said, you know what happens? He said, I'm sitting in there with the door locked. And he said, I read that verse out loud, even though I don't want to. And he said, I start praying that prayer out loud because I'm paralyzed. And he said, the darkness lifts like this. And he said, I go right back and do surgery and I share the gospel and I drop my kids off and I drive my wife around and I'm totally unafraid and bold. Why? Because greater is he than is in us than he is in this world. And we have the power of God unto salvation. And we're supposed to take the full armor of God that we can withstand even the darkness of Satan oppressing us with the only offensive tool we have, the sword of the Spirit. So I would encourage you to be a Christ-loving, Bible-believing, hope-overflowing servant of God. You're desperately needed because this world is so dark.